Welcome back from lunch. Hopefully you were able to get a quick bite to eat and check your emails and do a little networking in the last half hour. Those of you who were at our summit about, I guess it was five or six years ago, will know that you are in for a real treat. Our luncheon keynote is Chick Thompson, Executive Director of YG Labs and fellow Wahoo at UVA. And with that, I will punt to Chick. Great, thank you, Kathy. Um, hello, I wanna talk about strategic curiosity. And to talk about curiosity, what I wanna do is start off with a quote from Dr. Einstein, who said, Einstein never ever said that he was creative. He always just said he was passionately curious. And his definition of being passionately curious was, if the average person is looking for a needle in a haystack, they don't stop when they find the needle. They look for everything in the haystack that can act like a needle. And in these challenging times, also with limited resources and the unexpected, I think we all need a touch of passionate curiosity to understand and to come up with new ideas and new ways to deal with uh, situations. So what a, to, to, to take you to another direction on passionate curiosity, I want you to understand we all are passionately curious because we were all kids. And kids, when they have a box, just imagine what a kid does. Think back, you are five years old, you've got a box, a cardboard box, maybe a refrigerator came in it or a stove. Your parents are all excited about the refrigerator or stove, but you're excited about the box. So what did you, I want you to think back now, what did you turn that box into? So just think for a moment inside your head. Um, did you turn it into a castle, a spaceship, a sled, a puppet show, whatever you turned it into, you used a certain set of words to describe your actions. You said, it's not a box, it's a. And what's so fascinating about that language is that that is what we call out of the box thinking. It's not a box, it's a. So in these challenging times, we realize that a box is a finite idea. Okay, that's a box. But when someone says it's not a box, that's an infinite idea. And when HBO started probably 40 years ago, their branding was it's not TV, it's HBO. So why do I bring this up? Because let's think of our home right now. During COVID in this past year, it's not a home. It's a school. It's a library. It's a vacation. It's a restaurant. It's a theater. It's a to-do list. It's a crash pad. We are using that language of, of passionate curiosity to be able to deal, and with our families, to be able to deal with all these new um, aspects of dealing with COVID. And so to play it analogy even further, so today is not a Zoom lecture. It's an opportunity to go and maybe learn some new questions, to maybe look at the boxes that we've been working out of for the last year in a different way. And to be able to bring those questions back to the labs and the office when we get back there. So curiosity by definition starts by asking great questions. And I love the researcher, Dr. Jonas Salk said, the answers to my challenge already exist. I just haven't asked the right questions. So Dr. Salk gives us the answer. The question is the answer. And we all start off life asking a lot of questions per day. 65, actually, 65 questions to, per day, the five-year-old child asks, and most of them start with why. And then we go to 41 questions per day when we're three. And by the time we become 44 and 
or in the prime of our life, might have teenagers, we ask six questions per day. No longer are they why, they're what, when, and how questions. We don't ask why until we retire, and we ask, why did we walk into this room, which offers no value to the world? It's because our brain has started to atrophy. And what, so what I want to talk about, since I'm talking about strategic curiosity, is that why is the most powerful question to ask today? But I want to go and add a little something to that why. About 20 years ago, I had the great honor of spending a year traveling with a gentleman doc named Dr. Deming, who designed continuous improvement, total uh, quality improvement. And we were working with General Motors. And I'll never forget Dr. Deming saying, he was 83 at the time. And he was saying to the GM executives, if you see a process delay, if you see red flags, you say, why is that occurring? But you don't just ask why once, you ask why five times to get to the root cause. So when we see today's challenges, ask why, not just once, but a second time, why? Third time, why? Get to the root cause. And then to add to that, I think that a friend of mine wrote a book called Start, Start With Why, Simon Simonek. It's a great book. I would like to add to that. I like to start with who, because I like to find out where the pain points are before I even try to solve a challenge. And I wanna find out, is the pain a migraine or a paper cut? Because what kind of resources am I going to go and add to this problem? So if I start with the who first, who has this problem? So I can get to know the feeling and walk in their shoes, and then I ask the why, and then the what if questions, and then the how solution questions. If I start with who, to me, for me at 72, I didn't think of this who until about two years ago. And I go, wow, I wish I'd been starting with who 20 years ago, because it has made all the difference. I think it has added a level of empathy uh, to my problem solving that I didn't have earlier on. So I want to add a little bit more to our chart here. You saw the question asking. We go from 65 questions per day to six questions per day. Laughter does the same thing. We laugh 113 times per day at five, down to 11 times per day at 44. And it's rather interesting. I've had some 44-year-olds challenge me to go 11 times per day. That sounds like a lot. And for some of us, it is. And so that's why I've coined the phrase, calling it, when we become 44, we become what I call terminally serious. And that's okay, as long as you realize that laughter correlates with your question asking, which correlates with your creativity. Niels Bohr, the famous physicist, and I'm, I'm a chemist by training, so I've spent my years in the lab. Niels Bohr said, when people come up with an idea in the lab, they don't shout Eureka, they laugh. There is a direct correlation between laughter, which has a direct correlation to the number of questions you ask, which has a direct correlation to your creativity level. So the good news is when you retire, all of these things go higher, creativity, question asking, laughter. And that's why when you're really stuck on a problem, you need to retire from it. You need to walk away from it. And maybe for me, I'd go cut the grass or I go wash the dishes or I work on something else because retiring from something allows those ideas to go and just move around in your brain and come together. And so what I wanna do is offer a strategy if maybe you don't have time to retire from your challenge, you're, you're, you're with your, your team or you're by yourself, I call it do-it-yourself brainstorming, and you need an, an idea right now, a just-in-time idea, and that's what I call strategic curiosity, where you take the questions and then you add a framework to it. So the framework I want to give you is a framework that I've had my whole life. Um, 
I have been a cartoonist my whole life. And there's a picture of me at seven years of age. And I was drawing cartoons to try to improve my grades. I was held back in second grade because I have dyslexia. And I came up with the idea that since I got a D in everything I wrote and an A on everything I illustrated, if I illustrate everything I write, that would give me a C plus. And that strategy worked great all the way through high school. It did not work in college or graduate school. But that strategy came to me because my neighbor was a cartoonist. And for those of you that are into science and you maybe teach STEM, going and working with the kids, you know that the kids and a lot of STEM is based on the work of this cartoonist, Rube Goldberg. And Rube Goldberg happened to be my neighbor growing up in Long Island, New York. And if you don't remember Rube Goldberg and his contraptions, well, here's a cartoon he drew for me when I was 10. If you don't remember Rube, I bet you played the game he invented when I was a young kid called Mousetrap. So that was published in 1963. But Rube taught me an interesting framework for creativity that I've never forgotten. And it's really helping me in these times. Rube said, there's a cartoon he drew. And Rube, there, it was a cartoon to go and use a napkin while you're eating soup. But you see, you had to go through A through M. Rube said, the average person likes to go from A to B as fast as possible. He said, I like to go from A to B using all the letters of the alphabet. And I'm going, wow. That's what curiosity is all about. Because if we want to go from A to B to solve a problem, our training says, okay, time is of essence, bam, A to B. What Rube taught me is that Maybe you need to take a break and ask some divergent questions first, and then ask some convergent questions to bring your ideas back down. I'm going to give you an example. And I call this emergent thinking. You ask divergent questions to stretch you, convergent questions to bring you back down, and then your ideas come when you're out cutting the grass. Because let me just ask you, where do you come up with your ideas? So I'm going to show you if I'm 72. So I remember David Letterman. He did a David Letterman top 10 list. Here is the David Letterman top 10 list. Cutting grass, listening to a sermon, waking up in the middle of the night, exercising, leisure reading, during a boring meeting, falling asleep or waking up, sitting on the toilet, driving and taking a bath or shower. If these are the times we come up with our ideas, guess what no one put down in a meeting? I accept it was a boring meeting, but that's when you come up with ideas that are not related to the agenda. So how do we come up with ideas anytime, anywhere? Well, let's ask Rube Goldberg. If Rube Goldberg was trying to, was asked as I was asked by St. Barnabas Hospital in Short Hills, uh, New Jersey, and maybe some folks from New Jersey are on the Zoom call. Short Hills asked me, hey, would you run a brainstorm to help us redesign our emergency department? And I'm thinking 15 years ago, whoa, I've not even been in an ER yet. Wow, I started doing my research and go, wait a minute, what would be my divergent question? And I get, wow, who does triage better than anybody? NASCAR pit crew. How would a NASCAR pit crew redesign an ER? So I called up a pit crew in, in North Carolina and asked them the question. And they gave me so many ideas. I sort of got a mini pit crew uh, experience with them. They sent me videos. I used that analogy to run my brainstorm at St. Barnabas. Then I used the same brainstorm at Cleveland Clinic um, and at Scripps and about five other hospitals around the country. and. What I found is that divergent question of, hmm, how would NASCAR think? Because NASCAR's mantra is called the five S's. 
safety, speed, simplicity, self-confidence, and shared vision. Those five S's work perfectly in an ER. So you can see that you use the divergent thinking to get outside of the proverbial box, and then you go and, hmm, what's right with this? And you bring it back down. So when I look at today, and I teach at an MBA school here at, at UVA, Darden School of Business, and I've got a lot of very smart MBAs, average age, 27 years of age, most of them in the consulting field. And when they go from A to B, that's success. But what I try to point out to them is that's what life is actually like. It's the zigs and it's the zags and it's all of these little um, detours and pivots and stop signs. And you see that little starburst there on the left-hand side. I call that a creative collision. A creative collision is when you meet somebody or something happens to you, could be COVID, you use your curiosity and your new connections and your courage to act to turn it into something that just transforms your life. And I wanna tell you my first creative collision in my life. And it happened on the tennis court in Newark, Delaware. I didn't do well undergraduate. I did finally get an undergraduate degree, but I didn't do well because of my dyslexia. Um, and however, I was a good tennis player. And I was playing tennis one day and it was 19, never forget, um, it was 1970. Uh, and uh, it was a Wednesday afternoon and three men came onto the tennis court and said, hey, we're looking for a fourth, you wanna play? And my friends are gone. They're old. Who wants to play with them? You know, they were like 50 or something. And, you know, we were 19 or 20. And I go, I'll play with you because if you know tennis, you can't play tennis well with three. So I'm playing with this, this gentleman named Bill. And I'm the guy that asks all the whys. And I said, so, you know, why are you playing tennis on Wednesday afternoon? Why aren't you at work? And they go, we just quit our job at DuPont. And I go, what'd you do for DuPont? And they go, we made polytetrafluoroethylene and we extruded it. And, but we came up with a new way to extrude it so that it would have porosity and uh, air could pass through it. I go, whoa. I had only heard of Teflon as like you put on pots and pans. I had never heard of extruded. And I started asking them more and more questions. And then they asked me to play the next Wednesday and the next Wednesday. And by the fourth Wednesday, the fourth Wednesday they offered me a job. They had started their own company and that company is called Gore. My tennis partner's name was Bill Gore. Uh, his son, Bob Gore, who passed away last year, uh, had just invented Gore-Tex, polytetra, fluoroethylene, but expanded so we could control the porosity. And there's a picture of Bill and his wife. So there's my creative collision. If I hadn't, had, if I hadn't, taken that tennis match, I would have done what everybody else did that graduated from University of Delaware as a chemistry major, I would have gone to work for DuPont, which had been okay. But I got to work for probably the coolest startup in 1970 in the United States. It was the apple of startups. And got to invent medical products because that was my passion. And my best medical product didn't come from the lab, it came from being in the hospital on the third month of being there when I had to go and have stomach surgery. And I asked a nurse, why are the hospital beds so hot? And she said, they're hot because we have plastic under the sheets. And I go, why do you have plastic under them? She said, so that your body fluids don't get into the mattress. And I go, well, isn't there another way? Because these are hot. And I think I'm getting bed sores. And she goes, yeah, people get, they're called the cubidae ulcers. And I go, huh. And that's when I realized Gore-Tex would be perfect. So that was my first product. I made a Gore-Tex hospital bed sheet and all the patients slipped out of bed. It didn't work, unfortunately. And the challenge then was, okay, accept it. It didn't work. It was too, I mean, 
I mean, I had one patient slipped out in the catheter and came in. I mean, you know, it just was not good. So, okay, move on. Invented some other products. 40 years after coming up with that product, the folks at Gore called me and said, we just found a use for your, the Gore-Tex hospital bed sheet. It is now used in burn units around the world. It's perfect for burn patients because it doesn't debreed a wound and it could just be wiped down with alcohol. And there are rails on the beds because of all the ID units. So the patient's not gonna slip out. I mean, I cried all day because I knew that idea was gonna work, but sometimes it takes 40 years. I had another creative collision in 1974 in Charlottesville, just coming off of graduate school. I was at the Curry School of Education, just finishing up. And a, a young UVA law student said, hey, it's parents weekend. My parents are in town. Would you like to play tennis with my parents? And I'm going, mm, maybe, <laughs> okay. So I played with his dad. His dad was a thoracic surgeon from Cincinnati. And he said, what do you do? And I go, well, I, invent, I used to invent medical products. I'm now finished up my master's in health education and I'm a cartoonist. And he goes, I need a cartoonist. I go, okay. He says, I just created a technique to save people from that are choking on food. And he said, would you draw me a poster? And I go, sure. He goes, how much would you charge? I go, no, no, I'll be glad to do it. And his name was Henry Heimlich. All I can say is, how do these things happen? These are those creative collisions that happen if you are open if you are looking for the possibility. I then spent a year working on projects with Dr. Heimlich and that's how I got my job, which was my dream job to go and work for Walt Disney as an Imagineer and work on this thing called Epcot. And so I'm there, I'm all excited. I'm in a brainstorm talking about ideas and we were building EPCOT, if people know what EPCOT stands for, Experimental Prototype Community of Tomorrow. And one person says, hey, we need to use some new technology because people that are coming to EPCOT, we want to sell them our films or our educational programs. And I'm going, hey, what about this cool new technology called Betamax? Why don't we put Disney films and stuff on videotape? And a gentleman in our room who I didn't know who he was, but my boss did because he turned out to be the president of Walt Disney said, our cartoons will never go on videotape as long as I'm president of Walt Disney. And what Card Walker, who was the president thought is that if people use videotape, they would never go to the movies. They would record the wonderful world of Disney off of TV and they would show other people or sell it. And I'm going, wow, here's an opportunity. And I had remembered from my research on creativity that in 1927, the president of Warner Brothers said, who the hell wants to hear actors talk? Did you know that when the Beatles went for their audition in 1962, Decca Records said groups with guitars are on the way out? Where is Decca Records today? The Beatles then went on the Ed Sullivan show and the rest is history. So what I've learned is that when people say never, and we're gonna hear it a lot, when people say never, people are gonna, I call that a blind spot. And in a blind spot, that's where there's less competition and there's less cost of entry. So I decided to leave Disney and start my own cartoon company. Dr. Heimlich was one of my clients and I had doctors from around the world. And because to me, never doesn't mean never. It just means maybe not now. And so I started a healthcare cartoon company. And so I, my technique, and it was fun to think about it was, okay, if Disney has a blind spot, what would Mickey never do? Mickey would never do videotape. Mickey would never do educational programs on sexually transmitted diseases. And Mickey would never sell them for a nonprofit price of $95. So that's what I decided to do, to do. And so I contacted doctors all over the world. I said, what do we need in healthcare? 
And this is 1976, 1977. And the doctors told me there's going to be a pandemic of sexually transmitted diseases. And we have to teach ma males to put on a condom. So my first cartoon was called Peter Rises Again, which I actually drew. Yeah, um, and it's in full color, had great, great dance music to it. It was a minute long. It became a big hit. And then I created a movie called Herpy, the new VD around town. And then um, a doctor, the head of student health at UVA, Rich Keeling, who was helping me with the genital herpes set, he said, look, we need to be able to talk to our medical students about homosexuality. Would you do an animation for us? So I did an animation with two tennis balls, two gay tennis balls called Rolling with Love for UVA student health. But then a tennis player happened to see this who happened to live in Charlottesville named Martina Navatilova and her partner, Rita Mae Brown. And they contacted me and they said in 1980, 1981, our friends are dying and from a disease and it doesn't have a name. So I worked again with the doctors at UVA and um, we created the first educational program on AIDS. And I sold my cartoon company to Encyclopedia Britannica in 1984. And the Darden Business School asked if I would teach a course on entrepreneurship. And I said, I don't teach entrepreneurship, I teach curiosity. And they go, well, we're a business school. We would never have a course on curiosity. I mean, that's too touchy feely. So I put the word strategic in front of it. And it's been a course for 33 years. So if you're ever trying to sell something and people go, I, I don't know, just put strategic in front of it and it, it works. It's a great title. So I get the biggest laugh out of hearing Reed Hoffman talk about the start of Netflix, how he went to Blockbuster to talk about streaming and what did the people of Blockbuster say? Oh no, streaming, that will never work. So when you hear never, remember, never doesn't mean never. So what I, I think about in this is that there are 243 books on Amazon about how to follow your passion. And if those books actually helped you, there wouldn't be 243, you know, 2430 some books. Because I think you got to follow your curiosity. I think that's the key. Because passion is not something you follow. It's something that follows you. So follow your curiosity. Remember, we were passionately curious as kids. So now I want to go and give you another framework. Hopefully, as a kid, you learned how to juggle. And if you don't know how to juggle, I would go and pick it up again. Because in today's world of juggling, I think we are all juggling past, present, future. But what's really cool about juggling is when you juggle, you got to keep your eyes up. You don't look at your hands, you trust your hands. So I say you trust your past, you deal with the present and you look at your future when you're juggling. So how do you apply this to an everyday challenge? Well, juggling is three things and I call it the smash up. And this is my favorite technique when I need an idea. Give you an idea. So we got a call at Darden to uh, run a brainstorm um, and it was for Pepsi. And so I participated. This was uh, the, the brainstorm was at a place called Eureka Ranch in, uh, in Ohio and they specialized in brainstorming and Pepsi was the client and Pepsi had just created a soft drink called Crystal Pepsi and it wasn't doing well. So when we asked them, what was wrong? And they said, gosh, you know, the American consumer wants stuff clear to drink. And, and I'm going, yeah, it's called water. And that's when Pepsi said, we will never sell water. And I'm going, <laughs> I've heard it again. We will never do something. There's the blind spot. And the slogan for Crystal Pepsi was, you've never seen a taste like this. This was Pepsi that was clear. Homer Simpson called it invisible cola. John Stewart called a crystal meth Pepsi and it lasted on the market for three weeks and it was off the market. So we needed to create a new drink. 
So I got to talk to them about water. And they go, no, look, Nestle owns the market and the popular water is called Perrier. I go, yeah, Perrier is really good. That's what I drink at cocktail parties because I can't drink alcohol. And then I start talking to them about coffee, which was Starbucks. Hmm. So we needed a new drink. So I juggled. I said, what if we juggle the coffee from Starbucks, a Perrier 9.5 ounce bottle of water and Pepsi has distribution system. What if we made a coffee drink distributed through Pepsi and it came in a 9.5 ounce bottle and it was already cold and you gave it an Italian name. That's how we invented Frappuccino. So you might not know that Frappuccino was actually created by Pepsi for Starbucks. It's now made whole exclusive by Pepsi. But that brainstorm, that one brainstorm generated a $2 billion industry of the ready to drink coffee. So you can do this. The smash up is easy. In Atlanta, nine years ago, my friend Rob Frowine and I, he was an intellectual property attorney in Atlanta, and he wanted to go and create an app or for lending for small businesses to give 10 minute approval and make it mobile lending. And on a napkin, we started juggling ideas around and he created a company called Cabbage, which was a big FinTech disruptor. And he just sold it for $850 million to Amex last year. Well, also in Atlanta, I'm brainstorming with some mattress folks in 2009. And I'm going, give me, give me the three key things about a mattress right now. And they go, people want to buy online and not on store. People want 120, 120 night trial and health. Do you know the average person sweats 2.5 quarts of moisture into a mattress every month? So that means your mat and your mattress doubles in weight in 10 years. That means if you wanted a green mattress, you actually have a green growing mattress and you didn't even know, know it. So people want foam mattresses because they don't absorb moisture. They don't get bed bugs. So I said, let's go health online, 120 night travel uh, trial, make it out of foam, deliver to the home. And we created the first mattress delivered to the home, which was called Yoga Bed. My other friend developed Casper. So what can you do? We've gone through this year. I go and look at, whoa, I got Netflix, Disney Plus, all these different programs paying for a month. I haven't gotten a Peloton yet, but I know a lot of my friends are loving their Peloton. Peloton isn't a bike. Remember, it's not a box. Peloton is a community. Amazon, I rely on them. Every I'm getting not just toilet paper, but I'm getting pharmaceuticals. I signed up for the pharmacy service and I've got their Alexa app. And since I live by myself, I just signed up and I'm paying $5.99 a month to be able to call emergency services through my Alexa app. So I'm going, whoa, what if you brainstormed? What if you got with your crew, your staff or by yourself? And you said, what if I smashed up Amazon Prime, Netflix, and Peloton, the experience that they created? What ideas will this give us for telehealth? I think you'll have a fun brainstorm. And uh, please let me know what ideas come out. And I'll be glad to help you just take them to another direction. I'll be glad to volunteer and just help you. Because this is what life is. Life is so precious. It's not a straight line. It's deoxy, it's, you know, it's deoxyribonucleic acid, you know, and it's a sp double spiral helix. Watson and Crick came up with it. It's not a straight line. Hmm. So could ideas follow the same way? So think about who came to our home 60 years ago, house calls. But then nobody came to their home. We had to go to bricks and mortar. Hmm. But then we create a quick service or, or prompt medical care. Hmm. Opposite. But then we created HMOs. Whoa. But then we created click and mortar. Do you see that everything evolves in a spiral pattern? That's how ideas evolve. 
they go to their opposite as they're evolving. But in the Tao Te Ching, they already said that. All behavior consists of opposites. Learn to see things backwards, inside out, and upside down. So my new question for you to ask is, so what's the opposite? What's the opposite of what we are doing right now? If this strategy is working for you, perfect. But list five things, what's the opposite? And is there anything right in doing it the exact opposite way? Because maybe there would be a blind spot that you would see. So if you're doing a visioning exercise, what's fascinating, you're trying to say, so where are we going in 2025? And what do we wanna look like? Hmm, okay, list those things out. But then go, what would we never do to achieve these? And you go, wow, what would we never do? And is there, there anything right in that never that would help us to be able to go and um, achieve what we want to achieve in 2025? Because what you're going to see then is you're going to identify the blind spots. Then turning the nevers, we would never do this, and into a blind spot. And then you flip the blind spot into an opportunity. And for any of you that are in, in the intelligence community, um, are dealing with uh, telehealth and, and intelligence, and that's where I, I spend most of my time in a skiff brainstorming. Last week, I've spent a couple of days in a skiff working with, an, with one of the three letter agencies. And I always go and say, they were going through a reorg, uh, and I'm also working with the FBI on their reorg, but, this agency was going through a major reorg. I was working with science and technology directorate. And I said, I said a year and a half ago, I said, what do you think we need to think about to be able to really be able to go and do our job the best we can do and to be able to create the culture we need with the young people coming on in and all this, what do we need to do? But we can't do that because we're this three letter agency. And one of the people said, work from home. And I go, okay. So I said, I'm gonna give you a scenario. So now this was, this was December, you know, a year and a half or two years ago. I said, imagine there's a global pandemic and even people in Intel have to work from home. I want you to spend 30 minutes, what would we do? And the, the director of this directorate told me last week and, and a couple of times I've been there, that's the first brainstorm we've ever done about working from home. And you know, probably only 20% of the things can be done, but at least we needed to talk about that opportunity. So you gotta find those nevers. And what's so fascinating about finding a never, it also works at home with your family. When I was trying to figure out what to buy my mother 27 years ago, she was 82 years of age, didn't need anything for Christmas. And all she wanted was a meat thermometer. So I said, mom, what would you never want? And she said, a bikini. Now that's outrageous. Yeah, and you would never buy a bikini for an 82-year-old mother, especially when she works and lives in Cape May, New Jersey on the ocean. She'd get arrested. My father would spit food out of his mouth. But I made my parents come up with a list of 10 things they would never want. And on that list was a computer. Now, this is 27 years ago. So you don't, 80-year-olds don't have computers. But, uh, but when we saw that on the list and we played with it, we go, well, what's right about a computer with my parents? And my mother wanted to do family history and genealogy. And then we realized, whoa, that is an opportunity. So we bought him a 286 vector computer, modem monitor. And I gave my mother the meat thermometer also. Christmas didn't go well because I tried to get my mother to learn word processing skills on Christmas. And my mother was scared of the mouse and the wires. And she said it didn't it didn't go with their furniture. So we moved it in my bedroom. But four months after that Christmas, I got the first letter off that computer. My parents didn't teach them how to, to use the computer. The neighborhood kids came on over. 
because they wanted to see what this thing called a computer was all about. The eight-year-old kids taught my 80-year-old parents. My mother got her genealogy and my father sent me the first letter he has ever written me in my life off of that computer. And that's the letter that hangs over my desk today. So maybe you could challenge yourself. Where would we, when we were able to go on vacation, where would we never go? And make a list of five places you would never go and then see, see if you can flip them into a place maybe you would go because maybe it's been a blind spot. So I wanna tell you my blind spot as I wrap up. Robert Frost said, when I was young, my teachers were the old. Now, when I am old, my teachers are the young. And I realized seven years ago at 65, all my students are in their, you know, 27, 28. Hmm. That's not young. How do I get young teachers? What if I taught elementary school? So I go, hmm, how do I take this to an even another level? What if I've been teaching curiosity and entrepreneurship and design thinking for 33 years? I created what's called Waggy Labs. It starts for what a great idea labs, but it's all about ideas for good, ideas for your community. So we teach the kids how to identify community challenges, brainstorm ideas, and then pitch at a guppy tank. So it's not a shark tank. Shark tank actually scares me. A guppy tank for kids where everyone goes and builds on their ideas. And I wanna tell you about the greatest brainstorm I've ever been involved with. It happened in December. I, I thank the Lord every day for going, whoa, giving me this opportunity. 20 girls in Cleveland, inner city Cleveland, Warner Girls Leadership Academy. And the girl, the teacher invited me to come on in and we're doing Waggy Labs. And the teacher says, okay, um, the girls wanna help the homeless. And I go, okay. So we started coming up with some ideas and they wanted to give food to the homeless and this and various things. And I'm freaked. We sort of go, ooh, food, gosh, what about? They wanted to give candy to the homeless. I'm going, oh, diabetic shock. to giving these kids now. I said, let's go and give them M&Ms and a little baggie and stuff like that. I said, okay, but now I want another idea. And this little girl said, I want to make a face mask for my mother. And I go, okay, how would that face mask be different than the regular face mask. She said, my mother goes to work when it's dark and my mother comes home from work when it's dark. I go, okay. I'm thinking mother works second shift. The girl goes, I want to make a glow in the dark face mask for my mother. I'm going, that's cool. How do you, how do you think you'd make one? And one girl gets all excited. She goes, I got glow in the dark fingernail polish. I could paint on the face mask. And I said, gosh, this makes an experiment. So let's go and get some face masks. Let's go and paint them. Let's do it. The girls have done that now. They are actually going and distributing face masks out in inner city Cleveland. We've got people to fund them. They're getting free masks. They're getting free paint to paint on them. They're researching what kind of designs to put on there. And after all this, the teacher tells me, you know, the girl that came up with that idea, she was zooming in from a homeless shelter. Three of those girls out of 20 were coming in from homeless shelters. And I'm going, wow. How would I have ever been able to have the opportunity to work with some kids in a homeless shelter without this kind of creative collision? There are the kids in Accra, Ghana, that I Skype or Zoom with in the mornings, sensors of five to six hours where we're teaching Waggy Labs. And they identified catching malaria as one of their community challenges. So I said, so you gotta make a poster because that's what I used to do. I told them about the posters I used to make and they got, no, we're gonna write a, a song. I go, do you know how to write a song? They go, yeah. I go, do you know how to record a song? Yeah, we're gonna record on our, our, our cell phone. Okay, so I wanna show you a song that these fourth graders created. They wrote it, they filmed it. I did get a little help from the adults to do the editing. This is about hand washing. Wash, 
When the mothers got involved there, and now they do it in Tree, which is their native language. And, and you, can, you can see the full thing on YouTube. The, the song has become so popular, it's shown on all of Ghanaian TV. The community actually built two billboards, roadside billboards to promote the, the song, and the kids are now rock stars. They're doing other little songs. I thought they were gonna do posters, but that was 40 years ago. Been doing videos. Here are my kids in Nigeria. The kids in Nigeria found out that I don't have children. I always tell them my ideas are my kids. So they now say that their ideas are my grandkids. So to my amazement, I mean, to see those smiling faces. So what we do, we're creating what we call kidpreneurs. And kidpreneurs is an equation, curiosity plus compassion plus courage to the exponential power of kids, if we remember exponentials. And we actually teach our own design thinking component. I simplified it to ideas, imagine, define, experiment, act, and share. We've even created a card game for them, a 16 to nine minute uh, game to play about ideas for kids they can play at home. So as I wrap up, I want to close with Einstein who said, anyone can make things bigger and more complex. It takes a touch of genius and a lot of courage to move in the opposite direction. That's why thinking in opposites is such a powerful technique. So I challenge you, what's your opposite? What if you look at what are your goals? What are things you want to dream about achieving for work, for life? What course would you never take to further your career? Where would you never go on vacation? What restaurant would you never go? Just break your patterns and play with the opposites and then go, hmm, what's right about it? You don't have to do the opposite. I'm just saying, look at it to see if there's a right idea there. So as I close, Plato said it best. I didn't read Plato, I heard this on NPR, but Plato said, human beings strive to achieve immortality. And there's three ways to achieve immortality. One way is by having children. Second way is by planting trees. And the third way is by creating ideas and help make them happen. So I thank you so much and thank you so much for keeping the world healthy. God bless. Thank you so much, Chick. That was amazing. And I hope that we leave here just inspired to be curious. Um, there's so much that can be done, so much more that can be done in healthcare.